Hello. You're muted. Are you muted? Most definitely. All right. I'm still waiting on the um, Grow Ohio phone. Ohio to show up. I may send him a quick email. You notice how my logo's reversed? The letters are backwards, and I don't know why. Huh. That is weird. Okay. We're looking for Josh Phoebus if he comes through. Got it. Do you make me a co host? Yeah. Let's do, do this. I'll be curious to see. Oh, there's Josh. Of... There's Josh. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. I can't see it yet because I'm not a host. So I don't see the participants yet. There we go. And there's your co host. Awesome. I'll be curious to see how many students we're going to have today because we really pushed it, you know? Yes, we did. We've got a nice group in the waiting room. Yes, we do. Hi, Josh. How are you? You may have to unmute yourself there. Yep, he's muted. Yep, no, I was just on it. I was trying to see where the button was. You'd think I'd be sped up on it right now. Okay, so we're going to start here in, a, in about a minute. Um, I did forward you the questions, and do you have anything else you want me to add or just kind of go with an organic conversation? Yeah, no, and, and will you MC it, Lisa, and just uh, that yes. way with the questions, and then I'll, I'll do a good job trying to keep it concise and clear enough. Absolutely. Uh, what we'll do, I'm going to pause this. Hello and welcome to the Cleveland School of Cannabis Green Hour. Uh, my name is Lisa Warner. I am the Director of Education here on our Columbus campus. And today we are uh, very lucky to have Josh Phoebus here from Grow Ohio. He is our featured speaker today. How are you doing today, Josh? Doing well, doing well. Appreciate you guys having me on. Sure. Um, so I, one of the first questions I had for you actually didn't have um, on the first sheet. So this is going to be a surprise, but tell me a little bit about yourself and how you began your journey with Grow Ohio. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and it's one that uh, I ask myself sometimes. Uh, <laughs> very First of all, very fortunate to be here uh, and involved in this industry. It's a privilege. And I think that's how folks should uh, definitely view it. Uh, there's a great responsibility and a lot of you guys have heard me mention that before uh, but myself um, i'm from columbus ohio so i'm an ohio native uh, went down to ohio university played football down there uh, afterwards went to the uh, u.s army uh, did uh, three rotations downrange in afghanistan uh, after that got out uh, of the military um, and was was with home depot corporate and uh, you know it was it was good to go it was on the logistics side uh, but then shifted over to medical device sales. Uh, I was with Johnson & Johnson, uh, Wright Medical. Um, and ultimately from there, you know, very happy with that career. Well, had the opportunity through uh, a connection and that's normally how it plays out uh, to make the leap. Uh, Cause it was, I, you know, I had a, a very uh, solid career going fortunate enough, um, but to make the leap and realize, you know, the upside, how you could help folks and, and where this thing was going, but it was still, this was around the 2018 uh, time for 2017, 2018 uh, timeframe. So Ohio was just, uh, you know, uh, and made the announcement. Uh, and then from there uh, coming over. So I, I joined Grow Ohio. There was no facility. We had just won the application. Uh, we were first time operators. Uh, at that point in time uh, in history, we had only won a cultivation license. It would be staggered before they would announce the processing license here in Ohio. And the initial tranche that they announced on the processing side was only like, uh, don't quote me here, but five to seven folks. I can't remember exactly, but it was a small group because of the security portion of the application uh, had to be retooled and relooked at. So we were, you know, one of the first initial waves. So we had cultivation uh, and we went live with that. And then, um, uh, processing, but I came right over um, at that point in time. And the first uh, week that I spent was out in Colorado with our consultant, just getting down. But ultimately it was just a connection. Uh, it was it was something that lined up and I, I took the opportunity. Oh, that's a great story. And by the way, thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Yeah. So tell me a little, how large is the facility there at Grow Ohio? Yeah, so it's a 60,000 square foot facility uh, all the way around, just under actually, um, you know, it's, it's more 58.8. And from there, that includes our processing and true indoor grow, our processing operations and true indoor grow. 
Um, the facility itself, uh, realistically, we're looking at an expansion right now, um, and that's going to be an additional 5,000 uh, square feet, which is neither here nor there um, for the first floor and another 5,000. So really, we're looking to add 10,000, and that's just for processing alone, uh, just out, uh, outside the back of the building. Um, but on top of that, um, we, we do plan to push forward with the state and expand the cultivation space, which is written into code uh, 50,000 to 75,000, but push for that expansion, which you know, some, some uh, level ones and level twos are pushing for at this time. That sounds phenomenal. By the way, if anyone doesn't know, um, Grow Ohio is located in Zanesville, Ohio. Is that correct? That's right. So we're, okay. we're in South Zanesville, Ohio. Uh, we're about uh, 20 minutes off of 70 here. Uh, so we're right here in the foothills of Appalachia. So we kind of, you started to go into it, but I, I was going to see if you could kind of describe to us the amount of work it took from the planning stages, licensing, build out, and staff to get this facility up and running. Yeah, so I was employee number five outside the application team, um, which I was part of, but not officially on board yet. And so right now, total employees were at 115, uh, 85 full-time employees, um, and a majority of those constitute an hourly employees. Uh, there's uh, I think 20 salary for whatever, just for your guys' own awareness. And the whole planning really, uh, we knew uh, the excitement around after uh, the constitutional amendment had failed, legislation, House Bill 523 passed, uh, putting together, um, you know, the, the team, the application team came from a renewable energy background and the ownership group came from a renewable energy background. And putting the application together was a lift. Like I said, I wasn't an active participant in that. But our, one of our owners at the time had uh, teamed up with Threolite uh, or Medicine Man Technology uh, and cultivation. There were processing uh, we, uh, for our application, we worked with uh, MJ Freeway, uh, but it was a very, um, I don't want to say sterile process, but it was one where you, you knew the rough fundamentals and it was a solid application. We finished number two overall on, on the cultivation side. Uh, and like I said, I think we finished five out of seven. Um, for the processing side and just there's when the program was originally launched it was 12 level ones uh 12 level twos and um 40 processing licenses and so the you know the planning that went into it we knew that we wanted to be an indoor grow we knew that we wanted to be co2 extraction um just uh, just you know full spectrum um at that point in time believe it or not it was, you were either hydrocarbon, you were CO2, you were ethanol. It, it, now it's really become, you know, look, you need all the tools in your bag if you're gonna be successful uh, at, at this scale, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, CO2, we knew just the rough fundamentals. Now it was just a matter of working with that consult, the consultants that we had worked with on our application and bringing that through once you, you win a license, now what? But working with the state, they, you know, it was a very contentious application or awarding process. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of litigation and lawsuits around that and 119 appeals. And so we ultimately the state, there's a lot of folks that overfilled the champagne glass. Mm -hmm. and when they did that, the state was not going to allow you to back off of that. So, you know, going back to and trying to get revisions or things that maybe weren't mo the most pragmatic, fortunately for us, uh, you know, it, it pretty much was. Um, but that was, you know, something that we had to go back and forth on getting our certificate of operation because you get a provisional right, right upon uh, the awarding. But then you have to, you know, make sure that, OK, this is our building. They come and inspect it. They walk through it and make sure it checks out. So, you know, staffing wise, you know, we knew it was labor intensive. Uh, the, the process that we have. Um, and that's, that's why our staffing is the way that it is being an indoor we hand water, uh, we heavily upskirt and top our plants in the vegetative state, uh, we defoliate and defan, you know, two times uh, every plant in our facility. So really, we're, those are some of the things we're looking at, but we knew the culture uh, that we brought into the facility from the three light medicine man uh, guys, that it was more of an old school growing approach, but we want to apply that towards, uh, you know, the, the, the facility that we were constructing. That's a, uh, we, we knew that it was a complicated process and there was a lot behind uh, just getting up and running. So um, congratulations to you all for accomplishing that because we know it's not easy. Um, can you actually um, tell me some of the top selling cultivars that you have in, that, in your building? And, and do you have any idea why you think they're a favorite? 
Yeah, so I, I mean, some of the top selling cultivars that we have, um, layer cake, uh, we have triple chocolate chip. Um, and the one, one that's really grown on folks is Sorbetto. Uh, it's by Aficionado Estates uh, out of California. Mm -hmm. We actually have a Limestone 57, and that's not the original name. The state is very uh, weary around what you name your cultivars and even more around what you name your vapes. Uh, and that, that triggered through the vape, cri uh, I guess, vape crisis of the vitamin E acetate and that, that whole gambit uh, last fall. With that being said, you know, Limestone 57 is a sour OG by a Fire 18. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really uh, nice strain and actually, you know, canvas cups and high times, those in the industry, those, some folks, they, they know what those are and, and, and don't respect it. Some folks think the world of it. So mm -hmm. it's just where you fall in the line on that, but that, that's our, you know, two-time canvas cup award winner outside of that, uh, you know, working with Realite, bringing in clones, that's really the process. We phenotype 72 cultivars right off the rip from seed, which anyone that knows what I'm talking about can know exactly. that is an absolute lift. Right. Um, and it is really trying to dial in a facility and then within a new region with a new staff, it really wasn't a, a plan that, that, that we wanted to prescribe to mm -hmm. and giving full transparency into, you know, the cultivars, you know, three light had a very rigorous process that puts a lot of stress on these girls, uh, and, and, and knowing what strains that they used, they could advise and assist somewhat. But realistically, that you know, on that front, it wasn't a whole lot of guidance. So we knew with a lot of the exotics, they would be more finicky and whatnot. But uh, you know, we work with Exotic Mike of Exotic Genetics um, to try and get through that. But we really want to uh, start off with clone. Um, you know, directors of cultivation and cultivators, they don't necessarily because they don't know what you're bringing into the facility, mm -hmm. um, the tap root and just the, I guess, the, I don't want to call it the genetic drift, but, right. you know, knowing that you're starting from a fresh, uh, a fresh batch. Mm -hmm. And so that was a real push. But we, we started uh, with five clones as well. And that's that was the Super Lemon Haze, the Burkle, the um, I'm having uh, a lapse of, of memory right now, but uh, Super Lemon Haze, the, the Burkle. Um, the OG Kush, which was an original cut, but everyone claims they have an original cut. So I try sure. and keep it 100. Um, and, and so ultimately it was a, a mixture of seeds and cultivar and, uh, and clones that we started off with, but from now really layered cake, uh, which is a GMO background, mm -hmm. uh, you know, garlic mushroom onion type cut, uh, that, mm -hmm. that was one that really proved to be a winner for us, uh, so far. And I think it's, it's one of the top, uh, three for sure in the state. Well, we do have a question from a student who's asking, are you afraid we may lose track of the original genetics due to the renamings? A hundred percent. I that Coming into it, I mean, uh, there was a, a professor that worked very closely with the FDA uh, out of the University of Washington. He talked about corn and the commercialization of corn and FDA approved strains. And he used the example that there were, you know, three approved uh, strains that of corn that were grown commercially. And that, that, whether that number is, you know, spot on or not, but that was the example to where, you know, do you limit the folks? Because, you know, you get into the Punnett square of, you know, this is 60% indica, this is, you know, 60 mm -hmm. or 40% uh, sativa. You know, and, and you look at that and you, you call BS real quick. And mm -hmm. so, yes, to, to answer that question, I'm very concerned, especially mm -hmm. when you, you're, you're shifting around the nomenclature and just the going from, and especially when we talk about legalization across the federal board, mm -hmm. if I go from state to state and folks are using this from medicinal use, what really is the signature of that strain and what is the continuity? I mean, I would like to see, and, and people push back on me and call me a Brad and Chad, but more of a, like a U.S. patent type of registry, a national strain registry that is some type of a governing, you know, aspect of that and, and I know mm -hmm. that's totally counterintuitive to the culture and to you know it's it's a plant and it's it's give, given to us but right. uh, ultimately just for the the, the regulatory aspect and, and the consistency aspect yeah it definitely uh, concerns me and it's something that really bothers me especially when you try and track these lineages down I just told you about limestone 57 sure. people you know in leafly you know, it's, it's almost like uh, it's weeds form of uh, Wikipedia mm -hmm. and, 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 so, and weed maps, you know, some of these other things that, that are out there, but uh, ultimately, you know, right now that's what it is. And it would be a very heavy lift to try and clean that up. One that sure. I don't know necessarily that can be accomplished, but yeah. I agree. And, and to be honest, you know, I've heard many times that there really is no such thing as a land race anymore, that almost all cannabis uh, that is at least in the U S is hybrid um, a little, you know, it's either sativa leaning or indica leaning, but truly they're all hybrids at this point. So um, 
I don't know what your thoughts on that yeah, are, agree, but it's, it's really consistent with the American story that we're all we all immigrated here one way or another. I mean, there were native folks, but, you know, if you look at folks uh, genetics and, you know, the 23 and me, I, mm -hmm. I like to use analogies a lot. Yeah, it's it's all over the board and, mm -hmm. and it's very diverse. And I, and I think that's it plays true and true with where we're at with the current cultivars that have all been, you know, uh, bred uh, to do certain things, uh, mm -hmm. whether that's yield, whether that's bag appeal, whether that's, t uh, you know, potency, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, all the above, it's a cool, yeah. cu you know, back cross, whatever it may be. Right. And, and a lot of people try to recreate those same genetics, but they have, they have the same cultivar of a, a mother and father, but they're not using the same phenos. So that isn't necessarily giving you the same strain when you're crossing genetics using the same, the same cross, but different phenos, it's right. not going to work. You know, you have to, you have to be able to trace that back to the original phenos. We're getting all kinds of questions here. So I'm going to go ahead and continue with some of these questions. How you keep track of, how do you keep track of different strains and what kind of modern molecular techniques do you guys use to make sure everything is in the right track? So keeping really, we, we've consolidated it down. I mean, I only I can answer that word with simplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was organized chaos, maybe minus the organization part, uh, but you knew you knew what cultivars you had. Uh, it was a lot of labor, uh, keeping labeling on top of it, you know, and trying keeping things separated so that you knew I'm looking at seven phenotypes of this strain on this table in this room. And it's really just cataloging and documenting it. And then from there, and, and going back to the planning stage, mm -hmm. uh, three alight didn't believe in having a mother room. Now, mm -hmm. looking at code, mother rooms don't account, uh, count against your canopy. They like to clone off of only young vegetative uh, females. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did not have a mother room. So making that, I guess, audible, going back mm -hmm. to football days, midstream, you know, and keeping those things clearly cataloged. Right now, we're down to 10 strains, mm -hmm. you know, from the 72. And, and mm -hmm. you know, it's split about 50-50 when you look at the indica dominant, sativa dominant. And there's some along the way that you, you, because the other thing you look at is the hermaphrodite rate or, you know, the stress rate of what these plants can actually handle. And if they're going to herm on you, they're no good for what we need them for, for sure. the growing process that we put them through. So, you know, molecular and, and, and really it doesn't have to be that complicated for us. It's just a matter of discipline keeping them separated and cataloged. And then now, you know, each strain, we're down to one uh, mm -hmm. phenotype of each. Uh, and then in the phenotype process right now, I would say we're down to three of, of, of four different strains. So 12 different phenos versus trying to manage 1500 different phenos off the rip. So that's when it really became difficult. And it was, and I'm sure it wasn't a perfect process. Uh, for instance, we had a, a great strain, uh, Paradise Circus. Mm -hmm. And somehow, some way, uh, the plant got a little bit too old and we weren't able to clone off of it and we lost the genetic mm -hmm. and that was a bad day, but mm -hmm. those are how the human air and the discipline, you know, to it of, you know, everything's regulated through metric, you know, you see, right. you know, and, and a location is tagged to that plant, but that's a long one away of saying, uh, you know, really for us, there's no wizard behind the curtain. There's no special magic. It's just a matter of discipline and simplicity. And then we got it to a level now where it's, uh, it's much easier just because it's the only phenotype that you're cloning off of. So this kind of leads into a, one of my next questions. So what determines the need to bring in a new cultivar? When do you guys make that decision? Uh, hey, we've got these genetics. It's time to bring in something new and see uh, you know, how it goes. Um, really the market, uh, you mm -hmm. start to see some successes, you know, with the orange strains, uh, you know, and a lot of these states go through the similar uh, uh, transition you know, the mm -hmm. highest test, you know, I joked around because um, uh, I went over to uh, Greenleaf for a little bit and they were, you know, uh, about a year behind us because they won their license through appeal. Mm -hmm. And at, there I told him, I, I joked around, I said, if you could bring four cuts in of 30 plus percenters, I said, right now in Ohio market, you wouldn't have to worry about it. And you've seen Riviera Creek do that with Chocolope and uh, Garlic Cookies, you know, where they narrowed it down extremely. But really it comes down to the demand, you know, and, and what they're, what you're hearing from your clients, what you're seeing out there and knowing where your gaps are. I mean, you can look at the, you know, not necessarily going to land races, but you can look at the tribal separations, the, the, the groups of, uh, of 
you know, whether it's a Kush, whether it's a diesel, whether it's a haze, whether it's a white, whether it's, you know, you know, the different tribes and you know what holes are in your, your portfolio, you know, and, or maybe I'm really looking for a, a high testing sativa, or I'm looking for this type of terpene profile. Those are the, the different things, but really to trigger for us, it has to fit in our grow. Mm -hmm. And if we can't grow it, it doesn't matter what the market wants or if we can't get it to them. So we have to make sure that it's a rigorous enough, uh, hardy enough strain is a better word that can handle the way that we, uh, we, we put our plants because we're, we're really proud of our yields. I mean, we're getting over a pound of dry weight for most of our uh, cultivars that have made it to this point, you know, 0.75 to, to one. And the way we upskirt, you know, a lot of those are, you know, premier buds on the cola. Absolutely. And, and that was one of my other questions was going to uh, basically be. Uh, what techniques do you use to in, improve production at your facilities? Is that one of them where you're do, using your skirting and you're um, yeah. doing yeah. a lot of uh, deleafing? That's right. You know, and, and then there's trade-offs for everything you do. I mean, there's trade-offs for everything that you do. You know, we, we run a, a greater risk of, like I said, stressing these plants out and, and having them react in an adverse way. Um, but, you know, upskirting and topping the plant. Topping is something I think gets overlooked. Um, because really you're trying to optimize the sites and the cola sites where, like I said, your premium bud and weight comes from that's sellable weight. Uh, wet weight really to me doesn't, doesn't get me going, but I know you need, uh, you know, to have that, that feed stock to really pump in uh, the way the plant's designed to work. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, you know, yeah, we have a lot of hands-on approach. The defoliation, the, the, the schwazing is the, is the coin three light term. Mm -hmm. You know, I can go either way. There's a lot of folks that, that don't touch their plant, but for us, it's all about getting the air penetration, the light penetration, allowing those things to breathe. And whether, you, you know, you have to take off every fan leaf or whether you're just big leafing or, hey, this strain really doesn't need it. I mean, there's so many different variables that you can play into it, but between that and then the nutrients, you know, I think for us, uh, you know, then we use success nutrients uh, through the three of light relationship. And, you know, it's 11 part mix, which is a lot more difficult than maybe what it needs to be. And there's a lot of opinions on it. Cause I always joke around that everyone has a hired gun and everyone has a secret sauce, you know, mm -hmm. and the way that they do it is, but for us, it, it, it really is no skirting around it. It's heavy labor intensive, uh, intensive process to where you're, you're, you're making sure that you're bonsaiing that plant to maximize the efficiency and mm -hmm. channel the energy where it needs to go. Right. And, you know, we do have commercial cultivation courses here. And one of the instructors is asking about what kind of contamination screening system you use in respect to pathogens and pesticides. Like as far as how frequent your facilities require to do that as like regulation. And do you think that a new phenotype using modern genetic technology will affect the production of final end products by the plant? Those are two questions, sorry. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, our director of cultivation would be a much better uh, specific uh, to answer that question. I mean, I, I can give you the layman's version of, for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, we just follow the state code, everything that's approved. Um, and then what's best for our plant, uh, you know, and, and really it's at the discretion of our, our subject matter experts. So I don't really have a good answer and I don't want to put bad information out there, but it really, it boils down to, is it approved? Um, and, and are we, you know, really holding to the discipline of, of, of that process, but I, I'm sorry, I'm not much help on that front. That's okay. You guys, are you guys even approved to um, do tissue culture or anything along those lines to um, move forward a genetic that you may need to bring back to stability? Have you guys gotten into that but, at all? Yeah, no, I think everyone talks about everyone. I mean, tissue culture labs, there's some folks that say they're very, very difficult. There's some folks that say I'm very experienced and they're very easy. For us, we've definitely, we have the cap capability. We just haven't got there. I mean, and and not having a mother in, that's something that we've discussed internally to get there. But, what, you know, you can't boil the ocean and that's something for, our, you know, where we're at that, uh, um, you know, we have that locked in, but no, we, we don't have a tissue culture lab at this point. Well, it'd be nice to have at least a tissue culture lab in Ohio somewhere um, so that the, those cultivators could go to that facility if need be uh, to bring back a genetic that they're losing, right? So yeah. that, that would be, that's a big need. Um, so I wanted to get back to tell us some of the products uh, that you're processing there at the uh, processing facility. Tell us what those are. Yeah, so uh, we were the first processor to come online in Ohio. Um, we started off with a tincture, which was an MCT-based uh, formula. Um, from there, you know, using all natural, uh, you know, whether it's flavoring, you know, we use a, a natural um, yellow cake batter sweetener. 
Uh, and really, it's from there. It's a very fundamental product um, that, that that on the tincture front. Uh, but you know, it's now varieties. We have a 220 one to one. We have a 220 uh, THC standalone, uh, 660 and 660 one to one. And really, the tincture it's one of the oldest oldest forms of method of administration. But uh, for us, that was the tried and true way to cut through. And you'll see that with a lot of standalone processors or processors that come online that you know, it's, 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 it's not a very complex product to make. Right. Um, the, the second product that we rolled out with was an, uh, a CO2 full spectrum syringe. And at that point in time, it was oil for evaporation, uh, or vaporization or oil for uh, edible consumption. And the thought was um, that you could, based on the way the code was written and the potencies around what a one day unit constitutes, you know, what did you get approval for? So being first, there was a lot of eyes on you. So we launched an oil that was approved for uh, vaporization, but really it was, you saw a lot of folks that maybe the tincture wasn't getting it for them or they were burning through the tinctures and consuming them at a much quicker rate that then they would purchase the syringe. And and it really did, the terpene profile was so, it was indica dominant and it was sativa dominant because we were going through the phenotype. We It was not strain specific, which, you know, is not ideal. And so it was, an, you know, like I said, an indica grab bag or a sativa grab bag. So that was the second product was the oil syringe that some people used as, as, as a form of an, you know, just a concentrated oil that they were uh, going to consume just like a tincture. And then mm -hmm. other folks, you know, they, they were excited to vape or, or, or dab or whatever they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and they would put it, but it wasn't ideal for that, just the terpene profile and, and the way that it came together. So the third product and the product that we've had success with, and, and, and I, I really think is a damn good product is the, uh, the gummies that we launched. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's an all natural. The one thing that it is, is it's, it's gelatin based, but it's an all natural uh, gummy that the nano emulsification is what we're really big about. A lot of folks are talking about it, but since day one, uh, we've we've made the commitment to the uh, to the equipment and, you know, the, the emulsification and the ability to. Uh, really have that quicker onset, the, the increased bioavailability, you're mm -hmm. seeing it. And we joke around because you're competing against, you know, brands like Juan and Mindy's and, and you know, is probably soon to come and now Incredibles. And you knew that, the, you know, some of these tried and true gummies, but we don't use distillate. We use all full spectrum, you know, CO2 oil under our products. We do not use distillate. I don't, I can't say that clear enough. I mean, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of blog boards and a lot of Facebook groups, but, you know, we're not allowed to interact with those folks, but, you know, we're not using botanical terpenes. We're not right. using distillate, you know, and, and it's, it comes at a cost for us, but you know, look, you know, the fundamentals, we only get one first impression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's about the quality inside the product. And yeah, we're not perfect by any means, but we do, you know, I think a strong job and definitely the, the commitment to do it the right way. And where I, you know, my title was director of sales and, you know, you saw the next 12 sales guys behind me say the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, from there, CO2 full spectrum, really all natural ingredients. That was the, the crux of what we're all about. Yeah, solventless, play that in there, whether you think CO2 is solventless or not. But, uh, the, you know, that was that was big for us. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I talked about the tincture, the oil syringe and the gummy. And then, you know, then we evolved and it became, you know, the honey, which is not, not difficult to make, but from there, it was just, it was a consistent product and people were so, and rightfully so, you know, the price points in Ohio at that point, you know, had created such uh, frustration. And I think mm -hmm. is the, the right word to use that the sure. honey you know, really blew the lid off because it was a good product. Uh, it had a nice uh, sedative effect. And then it was 550 milligrams that you could get for just 60 bucks. Mm -hmm. So speaking to Ohio specifically, you know, that was where we, we were trying to speak to the patients and say, look, here's, here's a product where, you know, the THC milligrams, I don't have to, uh, you know, uh, price at a certain level, a certain threshold that I really want to, you know, be able to provide. So the honey was a good product. Um, um, so tincture, oil, syringe, honey, gummies, uh, the, that, you know, that's the core. Then we came out with a, a nice a hard candy that we called a lozenge because at that point in time, you got to realize Board of Pharmacy is learning too. Mm -hmm. And we could not call it a hard candy. We had to call it a lozenge. And so, because the attractive to children, now I, I, I've heard that there's a sucker about to hit the market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and when we first came to the market with the land grab stage, I'm like, man, I don't really want to go after uh, uh, a tincture or a very, you know, uh, mundane oil syringe. I hate to downplay it because at that mm -hmm. point in time, it was very important. But, uh, you know, we waxes, crumbles, uh, any of those vaporization products, 
Board of Pharmacy did not have an appetite for. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until, like I said, this has been a real time learning for them mm -hmm. until a little bit later where they opened to, you know, I think it was a Wellsprings wax crumble. That was mm -hmm. one of the first true concentrates on the marketplace. And, and that's, that was not approved. So you, you're probably looking at me like, guy, why would you lead off with those products other than your learning curve? It's because ph pharmacy was not going to approve at that time. And they have to approve every product. And you can sit there and argue code to your blue in the face, but it's what they're the judge and jury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and it, for my, for me, I am a patient. And so that was one of my experiences is where are the concentrates? Uh, you know, a lot of people are, you know, really focused on trying to stay away from you know, the plant matter material when they're vaporizing. So, um, you know, having a concentrate to me was important, um, especially for those that had serious uh, medical conditions that needed that concentrate form. So I hope that they are beginning to loosen up on some of those and full disclosure, I have bought your honey and it is one of my favorite products. So um, it's a very good product. Um, okay, so I have another question here. What are some of the future developments that you are uh, all working on over there? Anything in the, in the oh, vault yeah. that might be coming out? Yeah, so we're excited about a freeze pop, a true freeze pop that's water soluble, that um, you know, is a good taste, it's consistent. Uh, you know, and the, the, the tricky part about that is it, it's, it's approved uh, method of administration, but you know how folks are gonna consume it uh, within a degree that they might shoot it straight. Mm -hmm. They might dump it into a drink and, and I'm not condoning that if anyone from the state's watching that, but you got to make sure that this product's not only scalable and sustainable, but you have to make sure that it, it meets your quality threshold, but that you don't know how people are going to consume it. And they, you might find a method of administration that, you know, is, is something, especially around a freeze pop type of product that is a little bit more flexible, but freeze pops are something that we're very excited about. But just, you know, like I said, the first impression, the one thing, and, and I'm the guy, you know, blame me. I'm not going to allow anything to leave this facility that, that puts us in a threat because mm -hmm. once you have a recall, you can't, you can't, you, folks don't come back from that the same. They never mm -hmm. do. And nor should they, in my mm -hmm. opinion, because you, you're selling a medicine, you're selling something that, it, that folks are really relying on. And, and so for us, um, you know, freeze pops, and then we're, we're going to come out with a live rosin. Um, you know, it, we, we're going to have a bubble hash, but we're not going to release a bubble hash. We're going to use that obviously to convert over to live rosin because rosin is one of those, if you can do it right, um, which, you know, it's, do you have the right artist and the right feedstock and the right, the right plan to do that? But uh, live rosin and, 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 um, and freeze pops are the two products that we're happy about. And obviously with the luster pod and the pods that we've had, it's been uh, unprecedented success for us. Uh, and I didn't realize that Luster, it was a relatively new launch for C-Cell, which is obviously mm -hmm. a global company. So stateside, we were one of the initial launches on that front. So Luster pods have been a great job. So, you know, flavor drops on that front. And then I have a high potency gummy um, that's, that's it's unique in how it's constructed, um, meaning uh, the amount uh, of THC per, and it's, it's more of a, a, a concept of, of, of a puck concept. So from there, you know, a highly concentrated uh, gummy that, you know, as folks really start to evolve so that they don't have to spend 60 bucks or 60 bucks on a 220. And right. for the, some of those folks that, you know, are consume and have a tolerance level, you know, you put that amount and that lasts them, you know, however many, two days, you know, yeah. you know four days, that's not necessarily. So finding a way to now, get, you know, up that ante, uh, you know, on the edible threshold as I think obviously where folks are at. And then for us, we're going to have a nice, uh, you know, there's a lot of chocolates on the market, but, you know, I want to make an economical chocolate that's quality, that's consistent, that, mm -hmm. you know, people don't have to break the bank over. And so, you know, and that's, that's our mantra around here is that, you know, price might get you, but quality will keep you. And that wasn't always the mantra. You know, I think everyone gets obsessed with the craft boutique, high end, the best to ever do it. And once you start drinking your own Kool-Aid, you're full of crap. That's just right. not how it works. So being humble and, and, and self-aware, uh, I think that's where you got to be. And then realizing, you know, from a patient standpoint that, look, we want to do that. We would all the, a lot of the things that these patients are pushing for, it's just the, the, due to the marketing and the communication restrictions, it makes it very difficult to message out the way you want or to, to make sure that you can connect with, you know, the patients out there. And for us, we don't have a dispensary storefront to do that. You know, at Greenleaf, the, they have the botanist storefronts. So it was much more easier to control a lot of that, uh, that, that, that uh, aspect of it. But 
Um, so the, some of the, those are some of the new products, freeze pops, um, you know, high potency uh, gummy concept, uh, live rosin, and then, um, yeah, that's, that's really it. I'm very excited about live rosin. Um, so you were talking about, you know, the Ohio, or basically, you know, what do people want? That's kind of what you, how you base your uh, opinion on what's coming out next is trying to feel what the, what the Ohioans would like to see. So just from your experience in the past couple of years of, of being open and seeing uh, what Ohioans are purchasing, what do you feel is the most important to uh, our, the patients here? Is it the milligrams of THC or is it more about the, uh, you know, the novelty of the product itself? What are you seeing as far as whether it's flour or concentrate, what, what the patients are leaning towards? I uh, like looking at our numbers. I mean, it's 60, 40 flour to concentrate or flour to process goods. Um, obviously edibles continue to just, you know, looking at the state sales data, vapes are number one. Uh, mm -hmm. That'll always stay the case in my opinion. Edibles are, are you know, are, are number two. And then with the 70% potency, that's what we're, we're not really talking about mm -hmm. around because, you know, live rosin, it lends itself more to that potency. Uh, maybe it, it's going to sometimes tough to hit 70%, you know, mm -hmm. with such a natural product on that front. But, you know, at the end of the day right now, THC is king. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a big shift when this program first started. It was a very, very medical focused crowd that had enrolled into the program. Uh, I think a lot of that's the price point and, you know, of where it was at. And you saw CBD, but once the farm bill passed and CBD became that much more accessible, you saw that shift where, okay, I can sit here and tell you about entourage effect to your blue in the face, but there's a lot of folks that would buy THC products and then go home and, and, and maybe get CBD from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you definitely saw a shift on CBD, but really at the end of the day, it comes to TAC, total active cannabinoids. I mean, folks are paying for the total active cannabinoids and, and make sure that's delivered in a, in a, in a, a manner that's, you know, the best experience they can have mm -hmm. uh, and consistent experience they can have. So total active cannabinoids delivered in a consistent, high quality, uh, you know, way. That's, that's really what it comes down to for me. What does the state limit you to on THC again? It's a 70% potency limit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, of the total product, it, it can't exceed the 70% threshold. What about flour? Uh, is flour, it's 35%. Is 35, the okay. But, a lot of folks will tell you if you're if you're even close to that, it's it's piss poor testing or you're mm -hmm. it's not it's not necessarily accurate. Right, right. Okay. What um what are some of the um oh I wanted to ask you about your employees. So why do you feel your employees enjoy the work they do at Grow Ohio? Just kind of give us a general atmosphere of how how your employees feel about their jobs. Yeah, I, I can tell you that uh, as part of the, the hardest part, I think they have to go through is dealing with the, the learning curve of the overall organization. Mm -hmm. You know, you're entering a startup, you know, and now it's an immature business and people don't necessarily like the nomenclature I use, but I, I just try and keep it as plainly as possible that mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, the environment, they, they appreciate what we're doing um, as an organization that we're helping people. They take pride in their work. Overall, we just had, you know, functions, uh, we, you know, during COVID, um, you know, we, we paid them for 40 hours a week and they were only in here 30 because we went split shifts uh, just, you know, to try and, you know, maximize the safety. So we definitely, uh, you know, try and take care of the employees. Hopefully some of that doesn't get lost and just the, the building of the business. You know, mm -hmm. you, you can have a task organization chart and have it all dialed in on paper, but then actually you're only as good as the people that you have. I don't care what team, what business you're in, you know, you're only as good as the folks that you have, uh, you know, and for us, uh, you know, with it being heavy, heavily labor intensive and where we're located in Zanesville, Ohio, mm -hmm. fortunately there was, and unfortunately for them, there was a Cardinal Health opioid packaging facility that relocated down to Tennessee. So there's a lot of folks that didn't want to make that move. And it happened mm -hmm. to be right when we opened up. So a lot of that workforce was able to transition and there was some similarities there, but mm -hmm. I guess that's a long one way of saying that, you know, overall you look out, you protect good, good people from, you know, bad decisions and bad people and you're, you're hiring, you know, right. Hiring is so, so, so important. Obviously folks can say things in a resume, but getting them to understand that, look, you're not going to be, uh, you know, a weed millionaire overnight. 
uh, you know, and I use analogies all the time, but, you know, putting a gold uh, nugget in and getting a gold coin out that it takes hard work and it's a total commitment. It's a full contact sport 24 seven. You know, we tell people we're seven days a week and, and we are. And, mm -hmm. and I think when it comes time to actually, you know, execute on that, that's where you see people like this isn't what's for me. You know, mm -hmm. they, they thought, you know, for lack of a better adjective is a lot sexier than what it can be at times. Sure. So, those are the realities of, you know, having the patience with your business and, 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 and driving your own growth. One thing is that people talk about, wow, growth, 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 and employers say growth, growth, growth. But what are you doing internally to really separate yourself? It doesn't mean stepping on the heads of others, but really, do you take the initiative? Do you look out for the company? Do you appreciate and see it from their perspective? And it's not an us versus them, but look at it. This is all how right now, why you're employed by that company, how you get your livelihood and your career. We, we want career based individuals and, you know, our starting rates, $13 an hour. And um, we try, we have a progression system and, and, and I can tell you there's folks that have flown up and, you know, and the, and the, I guess the, the, the structure. And then there's folks that look, they just, it, it wasn't a fit and understanding, you know, what that is and what it isn't. I think that's where employees got to figure it out real fast and make sure that you're driving. Like I said, you're either, you're controlling your own, your career or someone else is. And if you come up, you know, for us and, and there's professionalism, there's execution and you're showing the commitment to your craft and you're taking quality, you're, you're going to grow. And that's mm -hmm. just, there's enough people that can tell you that. Well, it kind of rolls into my next question, which is what are some of the positive traits you look for when you're hiring an employee? Uh, you know, just when they first come in, what, what, what do you look for in an employee? Yeah, I, what I look for in an employee is, I, you know, I, I like to, obviously right now we're, we're forced to do a lot of Zoom meetings, but I, I like to see the way they carry themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if they come in, look, there's all races, types, shape, you know, shapes, mm -hmm. sizes, people, we don't discriminate, you know, and, and, you know, there's people that, you know, they'll come in here and, and they'll, they'll just surprise you. So from that type, you know, I'm looking for someone that has that fire on. And what that means is that when I'm talking to them, there's just the, the common, uh, you know, communication traits, being able to communicate, look me in the eye, you know, speak confidently and what they know and what they don't know, it's all right. You know, and from there, making sure that there's a level of professionalism. Uh, you know, when you guys were through the facility, that was one of my big things that I keep hyping on is, you know, show up correct. This is no different, you know, and if, in fact, you're under a higher standard. So when you show up to an interview, don't come in, you know, looking, you know, disheveled, uh, disheveled or and, and all over the place, you know, don't treat it any different. You know, mm -hmm. marijuana is very important, but when you're going through the interview process, there's enough books written over the last 200 years that can really give you a good foot, but there's nothing specifically other than I'm looking to make sure that their story checks out. There's a level of communication and intelligence there that they can, uh, you know, clearly communicate. And they, did they show up on time? Mm -hmm. Did they, you know, did they provide a resume? Well, you know, and just some of the key fundamentals and obviously for some of the other roles you'll look for some of their, their experience. And that's mm -hmm. a little bit more difficult because, you know, there hasn't been, unless you've been out West, there hasn't been a whole lot of opportunity on the East coast to really show that. So if you're bringing up black market experience, how do we do that? And I think there's been a learning curve on our end. Cause at first mm -hmm. the ownership group, if, if you bring it up into, uh, you know, an interview and, and, and the hypocrisy behind that, I totally understand where people are coming from. Like how yeah, mighty wise of you to, you know, thumb your nose down on us that have cut the way and lead the way so we i respect the heck out of that sure. uh, it's, you know it's not it is what it is and mm -hmm. i tell folks around here we're breaking federal law every day mm -hmm. i mean i hopefully the fbi doesn't take that too seriously but it's it, we are mm -hmm. and you can't pick your 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 convictions on a business model you have right. to be consistent and that's what i ask the employees is that they look at it, at it in the face and our leadership, as I've come back at Grow Ohio, that mm -hmm. you know, you 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 demand some things out of leadership and, and 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 communication and honesty and straightforward integrity to where I think that's just consistent with what this plant's all about. And there's a lot of folks that are just fakes, and 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 you'll see them in all aspects of life, but especially in the marijuana industry. And you got to be wary of those folks, you know, and make sure that you're entering a company where you're you're getting a collective whole. Nowadays, with through LinkedIn, through other means, there's ways to connect with employees without having to rely on an interview to gather fact gather mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean you know you, if you talk to an employee well i was at company x well there's a reason they're not there anymore right wrong and different so make sure that you're getting a well-rounded and i said you know take responsibility in your own career um so yeah that's that mm -hmm. that's and 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 for the students out there uh that's a, a good learning um 
a, a good learning tool, keep your social media nice and cleaned up because obviously there are employers out there that, you know, they're going to uh, interview you, but they're also going to you know, scope around and, 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 and check the story. And, and so you don't want your social media pages out there reflecting something totally different. Uh, so uh, just, you know, a, a tip. Um, so what has been the most challenging product to make and, and why was it so challenging for you? I think early on, it was the gummies. It was, mm -hmm. you know, as shelf stabilization, you know, and ultimately with the gummies early on, you know, are they, are they going to set up? Are they going to break down on you? I mean, I, I'm not throwing a company under the bus, but Standard Wellness, you know, they're, the, they were the next to come online behind us and mm -hmm. they're gummies would you know break down in, in the can and mm -hmm. that made it you know for us we knew we couldn't afford that because once people smell that especially at the price points they were at it, it's hard to take you know that product is serious again and in that company is similar to recall so gummies were very you know for us challenging because they were the first you know like like i said one of the first uh, initial waves for us and make sure that it was stable it wasn't going to mold it wasn't going to break down it wasn't going to melt and the hardest part around uh, around that what or what proved to be the biggest challenge was packaging and that's what i don't think that folks when they talk about releasing a product you know you can get formulators there's recipes out there you can get the the things that you need and there's a level of quality that that you know the expertise that you have to really elevate your product but packaging and make sure that it's done consistently in a manner that it's it, it has to be shelf stable for a year but mm -hmm. that when they open that uh that bottle or they pop open that product that they know exactly what they're going to get and they look in there that's that's really the, the one of the bigger challenges around these products is is making sure that your packaging and your product are stable and consistent well there are quite a few questions in the chat so i'm going to start asking those we're, we, and then i'll open it up uh and we'll finish up our hour uh, one of them is what's the initial training time period for the new hires in your company before they will be able to become independent workers yeah it really depends on what what role they come into so we've had a number of approaches initially it was you come in as a generalist and it's needs of the business and you get applied and you know the only breakdown was what division you were going to be in and then from there they would train you up uh, across the board for about two weeks and you know initially they were figuring out okay task the talent where should mm -hmm. this individual where's the natural you know alignment you know as the watering team you know and then getting the input of that individual now that we've matured a little uh you know and moved past that front we have needs and individual needs and clearing that up and still you know, trying to get that tight of, of okay, this is the post-harvest team. This is what the post-harvest team standards are. This is the way that they're structured. There is some fluidity still, but mm -hmm. uh, realistically coming in, you know, within the first two weeks, I think the first 90 days is, is what we're really looking to, to review that individual and make sure that they're stationed in, in the correct position. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, two weeks initially screening, you know, they get somewhat of a, a semi-permanent home, mm -hmm. uh, at least for the initial. And then when it comes to growth, you know, there's positions, you know, and sometimes, uh, you know, to get to that next lead position, you might have to go into trim, you might have to go into packaging, you know, it might not just be a flowering lead. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where, you know, there's a lot of folks that come in here and they're like, wait, no, I don't want to go uh, into trim to become lead in that next step up. Well, you know, that's, that's ultimately what we need right now. And, and you're, you talk about growth and I get it. Look, no, I'm a processor or I'm a cultivator. This is my focus this is what I'm good at. But, um, you know, you have to have that overall education to be able to make overall decisions as well. So you've got to be able to do every job. I understand yeah. that. Um, most of the genetic terminology uh, talked about in the beginning had me shook. Uh, well, you know, I understand. Um, so here's another question. That was, I'm sorry, that was just a comment. Uh, with you having served for our country, did that play into your role of wanting to be in the cannabis business now? No, no, it, it now it does because mm -hmm. I've seen it affect a lot of folks, and you know, and, and I speak cleanly on and, and clearly on this is that, you know, in comparison to alcohol, obviously, you know, I much rather the guys, my buddies, and stuff like that that are going through hard times, you know, use cannabis. Um, it's no secret um, because the suicide rate is out there. And I've seen I've seen it personally where 
consuming cannabis, you know, they're, they're much more likely to, you know, find a way forward and to get the therapy that they need versus turning to the bottle. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, there's no real science behind that other than, you know, anecdotal and what I've observed. So seeing that up close and realizing that what marijuana can do for those folks that, that, that suffer from the PTSD and suffer from just overall, whether it's, you know, anxiety is not an indication, but mm -hmm. that's, that's where we're at, you know, from, from my perspective, but was I a big advocate at first? No, I did because I'm not going to speak on what I don't know. And mm -hmm. I, and I doesn't necessarily didn't know, you know, what this, this plant could do for those types of individuals. I'd heard there was a lot of organizations. It's not new, but for me personally, once I saw that, uh, it, it made a big difference for me. I agree. Um, I've seen a lot of, um, uh, veterans with PTSD and I, I, you know, they have moved from uh, whether it's pills that they're yeah. on, um, you know, or, or, or the bottle or whatever it, it, they choose. And they are now able to move ahead in life and start to achieve and, and not be set sitting at home every day, you know, drinking or taking those pills That's and right. not being able to move forward. So I, I think it's incredible, even though we're not allowed to say it's a cure. I think it does quite a bit to help those uh, veterans out. So um, I agree with you there. So how many different departments or positions do you have at Grow Ohio? That's another question. So really there's three primary breakdowns. Mm -hmm. um, there's the obviously cultivation, the processing, and then the logistics side. Uh, and I, the logistics is a huge lift here in Ohio um, to be able to handle that. And I think it's one that gets put on the back burner but being able to deliver your product because there's the Amazon standard out there. You guys have heard me talk about that, but you know, getting the product on time, you know, for instance, pods, you know, dealing with the lead times from C cell, you know, every, every order that you put in a C cell, they consider a custom order. Well, with COVID-19 and throwing that, you know, that adversity into there, it, it really bumped those lead times back. So trying to project on what, uh, you know, the market demand is, no one has a crystal ball. I got it. It's the overplay cliche, but, you know, trying to really forecast and, and lock that in. So three divisions, cultivation, processing, logistics, and, you know, from there, the subsections of it just, it follows the pretty fundamental, you know, mm -hmm team, there's the veg team, the flowering team, the watering team, the trim team, the post harvest team, the cure, there's a small cure group. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, the packaging team. Um, and then from there's there, accounting and personnel. And, right, and, and, right. Yeah. And then on, the, on the processing side, really, it breaks down to your extraction, you have guys focused on, uh, like I said, right now, we're at CO2, and then we're, we're pressing. And then we're going to actually implement hydrocarbon here um, by Q2 of next year. So mm -hmm. You have extraction and then the manufacturing side and and our processing department we only have 13 folks on the cultivation side you're around 55 folks so um you know and like you said the front office support staff mm -hmm. you know whether it's accounts receivable you know and, and support there whether it's your cfo you know for me my title is director of business development um you know but i play into the operations a lot obviously your comment you know i the cultivation side i know enough to sell it you know and and, and i and i try and understand it and and become uh, more knowledgeable around it but the, the process it's still fluid you know and that's one thing that we talk about is is locking in the variables but this this where we're at and and this market you know we're an indoor grow we grow in cocoa perlite we grow and uh we use rock wool cubes for you know the um vegetative state you know plants before we do the so, you know the transplant but there's so many different moving parts that locking that in of what works best for your business and i can tell you the business that we started with the business we're at today there's some theme lines but nothing's necessarily locked in um to uh, you know locked in it's mm -hmm. just so what I think it would be kind of cool to do right now is we only have about five minutes, but does anybody want to ask Josh a question direct? Uh, if so, just uh, go ahead and unmute your microphone and now's the time, now or never. <laughs> uh, how are you guys looking to um, reduce waste within the facility? Because cannabis can be very wasteful. Um, I'm sure you guys are continuously looking at that, but how, how do you apply that or tackle that anyways? Yeah, that's a great question. So for us, I mean, it, it comes down to, we're, we're, we're synced up, like I said, with a renewable energy company and all of our waste goes to that renewable energy plant. So to reduce the waste, uh, really, you know, paying attention to detail, that's the step one. I know that sounds like a simple answer, but for instance, hand watering, hand watering creates a lot of water runoff. 
uh, to where almost 50% is run off, uh, for, according to our calculations. So, you know, that's millions of gallons a year right there going to a drip system is something that we're looking into that would that would be a big step the nutrients you know we, we're partnered up with three alight or we were we've sensed uh you know separate i guess we're moving away from that relationship um you know from us from a nutrient side but looking at you know the nutrient regimen that you have and making sure that it's the most effective for what you need and constantly looking at all the the st data that's out there within you know our body of work um, so, you know, the yields and, and only changing one variable at a time. So, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And experience is the one thing you don't have until after you need it. But, you know, changing one variable at a time and, and, and seeing how that can impact. And obviously, from a, you know, a waste perspective, we're HPS lights. Our, you know, one of our greatest cost centers is electricity. So, you know, looking at the LED and, you know, when we first started this LEDs, we weren't, we weren't sold on. Uh, and the, with the cost up front and, and with the yields that we were seeing and obviously working with the consultants. So, you know, I've just mentioned three with nutrients, water runoff, um, and then really personnel too, you know, making sure that you're, you're most effective uh, in the way that you're staffing and building out your teams. Um, because, uh, like I said, we're two years into this, you know, two and a half years into this. And it's one of those things where, like I said, it is fluid and it is sh somewhat shape shifting. You have some rough fundamentals, but those are some of the ways that we're looking at waste is just, you know, every purchase, you know, obviously, obviously has to be approved and uh, you're a value shopper at some times. And there's some times where you don't want to go, go low on, but uh, you know, those are some of the things that you look at. So that's, that's, that's where we're at on the waste. JJ actually had one more good question in the chat. So I'll go ahead and uh, repeat that for you, JJ. How are you, how are you prompting your customers or clients to share their experiences back with you to get real-time info? If it's just higher THC, that is the best seller. Do you feel Ohio is more of a rec market than medical? It's a long so, time. Yeah, that was actually two and I actually, I didn't post it That's correctly. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, but yeah, I guess, uh, do you guys have a way of collecting real-time info from your patients to get back to you to see what's working, how it's working, how it's maybe hitting a different target than what you thought compared to just what is selling the best? No, that's a good, that's a good call. I mean, I, you said what's selling the best and, and to back up like TC, I, like I said, total active cannabinoids, that's important, but that, that, that's the, I guess the prioritize that's, that's what's the priority, whether you have a, you know, great terpene profile, I got it, you know, and, and, and the way the product comes across, but uh, to get customer feedback, I mean, we monitor the boards. Um, we, 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 you know, have a customer support uh, team that's very active. Trust me, they're very active. Um, because we don't have a dispensary. We can't, you know, and, and, and that's, I think what you're getting at is how do we control that? So we get statistics from the state, you know, our partners and dispensaries will, you know, show us the sell through data. And then outside of that, just word of mouth, that's really staying in tune with your, your, your frontline folks, you know, these dispensaries, the, the key employees out there, the, you know, dispensing agents that are, are talking with these folks. And I think that's the biggest opportunity. Um, we've just hired a brand new director of sales. Uh, we've had some turnover in that department, but making sure that the dispensing and the frontline individuals are very educated on your product um, and, and staying tuned on that because so many folks just want to, you know, set up a PED and go directly to the patient. But if you think about it, who really controls the narrative, the MDs and the DOs that are doing the recommending, I mean, a lot of times they're doing it through these, these different setups where you're not getting the, the, I guess the traditional uh, medical consultancy. So, uh, you know, at, at the botanist, we had a pharmacist that would handle that, but, you know, there, to a certain degree, you know, there's only so much information and feedback that you can get that's that's more than just opinion. Um, so we'll we'll take that in and we'll look for trends uh, and guidance on that front. But you know, realistically, it's just staying active with our partners and then the customer support. Uh, like I said, people are not bashful. They reach out and they'll say things all over the board. But from there, you pick out you know where are we trending. This is something that we really want to look at because maybe there's been four emails around this and that's enough for us to say you know I, that, that that makes sense. And so just, you know, managing real time on top of that, but that's a long one way of saying working with your partners and through our customer support um, uh, outreach. Anyone else? We're just about finished up here, but we have time for another question. Does anybody else have anything? Yeah, um, I have a question. It kind of goes along with that. Um, when Obviously, you know, you have competitors in Ohio because we're just a medicinal state. How often do you look at 
other cultivators in Ohio, but how often are you looking at other cultivators out of state to kind of give you guys like a good blueprint? Like how often are you looking at places that don't have the same laws and rules applied in Ohio? All the time. All the time. I always say it's like a lot, a lot like fashion where it starts out on the West Coast moves and, and whether that's true or not, you know, uh, but we're, we're, we're looking at those states because they've been doing it. I mean, they, they've been doing it for, you know, close to 20 years in some states. So, you know, you, you'll look out there and and, uh, and and see what products are moving for them. What are the trends? What are the different things? But all the time and short all the time. And even on the medical markets, you know, looking at we looked at Illinois a lot. Uh, we looked at uh, Maryland. Um, we didn't really look at Florida or some of these or New York, uh, but, you know, especially uh, during just the review, but looking at those other states, PA is obviously a huge one that you look at and, you know, where, where's their pricing? Where are they trending? What products do they have out there? What products seem to be moving? And then obviously, you know, it's just staying in tune with the resources that are out there, whether it's, you know, an MJ biz or cannabis business times or the network that you've developed or some of the, you know, uh, folks that you, you know, you follow on, whether it's YouTube or some of the social media stuff or, really it just comes on the network and the professionals that you know and expanding that network but all the time are we looking you know like i said because the answers are already out there in a, in a lot of ways and you know you're some folks are just trying to recreate the wheel and put their brand on it and for us it's a balance of both we just we we don't want to overcomplicate it we want to make sure that we're always pushing the envelope but you know um we don't want to get too cute either we want to make sure that we can control a lot of the variables all right well, it is one o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, let Josh go about his day. He is a very busy guy, but I thank you so much for all the information. It was a great uh, Q&A, and um, hopefully we'll be able to come through and bring some newer students through that have not been able to see the facility next year. I think it was a great opportunity for those that were, were able to go. Um, do you have any final thoughts, Josh, before we go? No, I just want to say, you know, I appreciate what you guys are doing. I mean, like I said, making the commitment to go to school and, and, and get certified and trained up and educated on it. You know, you're the you're the, the generation, you're the future of this. I mean, as we legitimize what we're doing and it's going to happen at a very quick speed, uh, the folks, the old heads that I talk to, to see what's happened within the last five years versus the previous 15, it just continues to move at light years ahead. So you know, stay frosty, stay on top of it, be good at your craft, be committed to it and be a good person. You know, ultimately, you know, don't lie, cheat or steal and, and be honest to the folks and be a good steward of, 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 of the plant. It deserves it. And and I think ultimately, if you do that, then you'll be in good hands and, and, and you'll have a fun time and a, and a successful career. But you got to drive it and you got to control it and you got to continue to progress because the information is such a real time. And if you're not uh, staying up on it, you're going to get left behind or you're, you're going to you're going to stunt what your potential is. Thank you. That was some very, very good advice. And um, I just wanted to thank Grow Ohio and you, Josh, for everything that you're doing in our community. And hopefully, uh, by the way, uh, one thing we didn't mention uh, with the processing products uh, for Grow Ohio, if you are in a dispensary, if you see the logo, the butterfly effect, mm -hmm. that is from Grow Ohio. Um, so, you know, I wanted to mention that so that they could tie the products together with Grow Ohio as well. Are there any other logos there other than butterfly effect that you're no, using? No, it's butterfly effect. And then to JJ's question, like, look, let us know, you know, we hear, you only hear about the bad sometimes. Let us know if there's good or let us know if there's tweaks or things that we can do, uh, you know, to enhance our product. But we take a lot of pride, you know, and, and, and our and not that everyone doesn't but for us we're committed to doing it the right way because we feel that's the only way that you're going to have any type of longevity or retention of your of your patients or your your customers so let us know and and ultimately you know we'll, we'll, we'll continue to try and do our best uh, you know i think there's an expectation of perfection sometimes uh but you know like i said we're very self-aware and we are very uh i guess interactive on trying to make the changes that people want it says, I got a comment out here from Jamie that says the new lotion that you guys have out is awesome. So it's great to hear people. People love that. Crush Berry seems to be a favorite as well. Someone said, so keep yeah. it up. We appreciate it so much. And of course, we'll always be in contact and uh, thank you for your time and have a wonderful weekend. No, thank you guys. Thanks for your opportunity. Stay safe and, um, and take care. All right. Have, have a good one. Thank you so much for all the students who participated and we'll see you out there in the next green hour.